Let me just quote it to you. Uh, we won't take the time to turn to it right now, but uh, I'm sure you've heard it. Maybe you've uh, read it yourself from time to time. But Hosea chapter, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 makes this statement that uh, he said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How many ever heard that before? Y'all remember reading that up here? My people are destroyed. God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of turn that around, look at it you know, the other way around. My people are delivered because of knowledge. Amen. We're, burying, we're burying people every day because and they, and they, they died way too young. Or if they had sufficient knowledge in their life, they wouldn't have died. You have knowledge will give you the knowledge of God will give you the ability to overcome anything. Amen. If you want it. But you have to change the way you think. Yeah. Well, that's what the knowledge of God does. Changes the way you think. That's Amen. right. I took the time to look it up, but you can find, uh, be not ignorant, that you find that statement, I would not have you ignorant, be not ignorant, six different times in the New Testament, and a variation of that more than that. But apparently, the Holy Ghost is trying to get ignorance out of the church. That's right. All ignorance is, is a lack of knowledge. Now, stupid is something else. <laughs> stupid takes a lot of prayer and a lot of faith and a lot of, whew, a lot of geese raising power. <laughs> Amen. But ignorance, all you got to do is just get knowledge. If you're ignorant of a light switch, I mean, plugging in a wall over there, that means you stand a high risk of getting electrocuted because you're ignorant of what's going on in that little box in there. But if you know what's in that electrical outlet, you know how to deal with it. And you're not, you know, hurt by it. Mm -hmm. Listen, the Bible says, Satan, the thief, comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10. Y'all probably heard that before. But if you have the sufficient and proper knowledge of God's Word, you know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Amen. And directly you, directly you stand up and say, Turkey, you can knock yourself out, but you're not doing that here. The stealing and killing and destroying, you just take that down the road where they believe in that. You're not doing that here. No. God said, with long life, he would satisfy me. And bless God, long life is what we're going to have. <laughs> Geese and all. Well, I ain't got all that testimony yet. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 That was a turning point. Yeah, I'm sure. Bless God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, that's every pastor's job is to remove ignorance from his church. Again, ignorance is not a bad thing. It's just something. It just means you, you just don't know something. And the more knowledgeable you become, the less ignorant that you are. I mean, it sounds like a bad word, ignorant, but it's not. It's just a lack of information. Amen. Amen. All right. The last three Sundays we've been teaching on a subject. The, the first one was called the King's Table, and the last two after that, uh, it, it, we're going to look at this, this thought: is lame feet, lame feet. And, uh, well, did I tell you, go to 2 Samuel chapter 4. I didn't tell you that. 2 Samuel chapter 4. And we're going to a text that, uh, that talks about the, these thoughts that I just showed you. Okay? If your feet are lame, your walk is all messed up. Isn't that right? Yes, I know. If your feet are healed, you're going to be pretty good. We're going to find that thought in the natural context where a man's feet was actually all messed up and he just couldn't walk that. But it has a spiritual connotation for the church. Or anybody else who's listening for that matter. Okay. Uh, you read something like what we're about to read here and you have to ask yourself, what in the world is that doing in the Bible and why do I need to know it? Okay. All right. If you found 2 Samuel chapter 4, say amen. Amen. Verse 4. Verse 4. It says, in Jonathan, Saul's son. Saul was the king of Israel at that time. And, and Saul did not like King David. David was not king at this time. Saul was king. And, uh, but David had been anointed by Samuel to be king. But Saul was on the throne. And Saul wasn't getting off of it. And David wasn't going to take him off. So he just let Saul stay there until Saul just died or quit. When Saul finally got killed in battle. Okay. Although David was anointed to be king, he waited 20 years for Saul to leave the throne. 
And that whole 20 years, Saul was trying to kill David because Saul was jealous of him. The ladies of the community went around saying, Saul killed his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. And while the whole community was just rejoicing and praising David, and Saul, the king, was just standing back to see them because they weren't worshiping him like they were David. I mean, who's this peon David anyways? The only, well, the only God was on David's life. Saul didn't like it, so he's continuing trying to kill him. Well, here's the problem with that whole thing. If everybody in Saul's family knew that Saul was trying to kill David, and so they knew the moment was coming when Saul was going to leave that throne and David was going to get on it. And when they, in their mind, when he did, they thought, they're toast. He's going to come after us and kill every one of us. That was what was going on in their thinking. So in verse 4, it says, Jonathan, Saul's son, uh, had a son that was lame of his feet. Y'all see that? He was five years old when tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And the tidings that they're talking about is Jonathan and Saul were killed in battle. Okay, so, so this, these tidings of his death came. And, 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 and uh, Jonathan's son's nurse, it says, took him up and fled. They're getting out of Dodge because they just know David is coming to kill them all. They're making a fear-based decision. And he, took, he took him up and fled, and it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he, Jonathan's son, fell and became lame. Y'all see that? Well, I have one loaded verse when you take it apart. I'd have to go back and preach the last three messages to get all that out. But anyway, and his name was Mephibosheth. Who in the world would want to name their son Mephibosheth? If you got really mad at Mephibosheth, you'd be talking in tongues before you got it out. <laughs> Trying to say that real fast. But Mephibosheth's name means I will exterminate her, okay? He's, and it's suggesting and it speaks of the repentant character. Because if you exterminate the idols in your life, who's left? That's just God. You're not worshiping idols. You're not bound down to your car, your, your, your house, or your clothes, or anything. You're bound down to God. You, you, you're enjoying all these things, but you don't worship them, okay? Let me just, let me just run something back right quick when I'm thinking about it. You can find the word love a gazillion times in the Bible. I don't know how many. A whole lot of times. Love. Only one place in the entire Bible. I the way the word is tonight. Let's say it this way. One place in the Bible, Isaac uses the word love to define his affection for deer meat. He says, I love venison. Use that word. But every other time that you find the word love in the entire Bible is in one or two contexts. Love for God and man or love for sin. There's people who love sin. It's love. Go up to Las Vegas and stand around and watch. Love from God was never designed to be used in any other context except for man and for him. But we use that word real loose. Well, I love my old truck. Mm, don't mess with it. Did you know there's people buried today because somebody messed with somebody's truck? Somebody's car? I really love this house. God bless me. Oh, I love this house. And somebody comes in and gets dirt on the carpet and they just have a screaming fit. Oh. Listen, enjoy what God has given us in this life. Enjoy your truck, enjoy your house, be fond of it. I mean, like it. Take care of it, bless it every way you can, but don't fall in love with it because love is designed and set aside by God only for Him and for people. I mean, if you just want to break right now to what love is actually for. We love our children, we love our parents, we love our wives, our husbands, we love God. Everything else comes under that in the. In the, in the, in the I really, I really like category. I'm really fond of category. Okay? But love is just for God and people. Whatever you do, don't love sin. All right, Mephibosheth. He was lame in his feet. Well, I've got to, I've got to recap some of this this morning. I wasn't going to do this, but he's five years old. Is the Bible not say so? Yes, amen. All right. Wow. The picture that's being painted here Praise the Lord. 
there's an age of accountability to everyone. <coughs> They're born into this world. They live one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe nine, ten years old. But at some point in that early time frame, they become of the age of accountability to whether they're responsible for their sin. The wrong doing it, they're doing it live. The five, year, five years is, is used here, okay? But the reason this young man fell is because of the fear-based decisions being made in the home he was living in. He learned, he, he learned sin in the home. And so did you. We learn, we learn hatred. We learn prejudice. We learn, we learn how to, that's where we fail from being right with God. In the natural, you know, from the time you're born to the age of accountability, you die, you go straight to heaven. But if you come to that age of accountability and you don't get born again, you're going to hell. Okay? But people fall spiritually in their formative years. Formative, I have a hard time saying that. In their formative years. And so if the devil can get a bunch of junk going in mom and dad's mind, or the nurse's mind, or the caretaker's mind, or the guardian's mind, if he gets a lot of crazy junk going on in their mind, they'll impart that to that little guy in that house. And he'll grow up just as work twisted and crooked as they were. And so at some point or another, he needs a Savior. So do you. Amen. So do I. Amen. 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 So he fell. And the Bible says he fell, he became lame in his feet. What does that mean? From the time he fell forward, his walk was not right, and neither was yours. And nothing short of this new birth and getting right with God, do you ever get your feet fixed, spiritually speaking? Until you learn to walk around. And even after you get saved and, you, and, and you're born again and you're right standing with God, you still got to learn how to. I mean, you get a little guy born in this world of natural. He, I mean, he's perfect in every way, but you turn him loose, walk, you hit the floor. <laughs> he don't know how to walk. Perfectly good legs and feet. He's going to have to use them. Same thing in the church. People get born again, and the next day you make one of them, they might cuss. You know, I mean, they got their. They're still trying to. What happened last night at the altar? I don't know. You know, they don't know what happened to them. But if they'll stay in Father's house. Amen. They'll just stay in Father's house and not be spiritual runaways. They'll learn how to use their legs and feet. Glory to God. All right. Just turn the pages a little bit to chapter 9. Amen. Nine chapter of 2 Samuel. I'm not going to take the time to read all this over here, but uh, let me just take you to, to, to the verses I want to just outline. Uh, verse 7 of 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let me back up here to verse 4. Well, you can read the whole thing. I'm not going to do that. But David has now become king of Israel. He had a great relationship with Jonathan. In fact, he was in covenant relationship with Jonathan. Well, now Jonathan, Saul's son, is dead. And so he's asking around. He said, is there any of Saul's house still left, any of Jonathan's house still left, that I can show kindness to? Well, all of Jonathan's house didn't know he wanted to show kindness to him. They thought he was going to kill him because of how Saul had treated David. Okay? But he said, he said, is there anyone I can show kindness to? And somebody said, well, Jonathan's got a son. David basically said, well, where is he? And verse 4, said so the king said, so where is he? In verse 4 of, of chapter 9, Ziba, I think, said unto the king, Behold, he is in a house, and he's in, he's in, a, in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, and Lodabar. If you don't know the word study, you'll never know what you just read. But the word Lodabar, by Hebrew definition, means no pasture. He's lame in his feet. And there's no pasture. Well, if you live in, a, in, a, in, a, in an agrarian society, we live by the, agri the agriculture. If the ground don't produce, you die. The cattle don't live. The camels ain't working. Ain't nothing working. You don't eat. Ain't nothing. If, you, if there's not pasture of some kind, if that ground is not working for you. And so here this young man is living in total poverty. Abject poverty. And all of a sudden, you know, the king says, where's this guy? When the king comes looking for you, I mean, you, you look out the window and say, whoa, what's all them limousines doing out there? The king, the king has sent the automobile down there to get you and come to his house. Not because of you, 
but because of the relationship that he has had with somebody else. Amen. Amen. God and the Lord Jesus Christ had a relationship with one another because I accepted Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. God got looking around and said, is there anybody out there that I can show kindness to for Jesus' sake? Amen. He said, well, that Johnson guy down there in Mount Judy, he, he claimed Jesus to be his Lord. He said, go get him. Amen. Bless God. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost showed up. Woo! <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. And I'm not living in poverty anymore. Poverty has no legal right on me. I, I was talking to a young man last night. Listen, y'all do this what you want to. I'm just going to tell this to you, okay? It's up to you. I'm not trying to make an issue out of nothing. This, tape. The, the, this young man, we, the church is open. We went to church last night, and this, this church is open, and this young man standing there talking. And I said, well, do you have a home church? And he said, well, I went to a church, and he told me where they're at. But he said, I don't believe in them double-vested, breasted suits and ties. So I don't believe in that. Man, I don't go where somebody wears stuff like that. Well, that's his privilege to be that way if he likes. But somebody needs to tell him that that is exactly the way Jesus dressed. Now, neckties were not invented in his day, okay? But Jesus had the finest threads in town. He had the equivalent of a shark skin suit. It was the clothes he wore. Because the day of his crucifixion, all he had to, to, his, all he had to his name was the clothes he had on his body, okay? And they were separating the possessions. I don't know what they had. To, and to throw that cross, they come to his come to his clothes. They started to rip that up and divide that among those soldiers. And one said, "Whoa, man, let's don't tear that up." And that's some threads. Mm -hmm. Fine clothing Amen. woven throughout without a seam. The Bible says he had the best clothes in town. We've covered the subject many times, but Jesus Christ, your Lord and your King, was a very wealthy man in this life. In his ministry. Well, he was not poor. Like people want you to believe. People embrace poverty because they don't know how to believe against it. So they just bring Jesus down to their level and make a doctrine to surround it and make it sound good. Jesus is poor, so I'm going to be poor. Well, if you want to do that, that's fine. But the Bible says he was rich. Amen. It says he was rich. Mm -hmm. Amen. So why don't we just come up to his level? Amen. Let's go. Hallelujah. Anyhow, moving on. He went down to Lodabar to get him. The king, and what the king takes you out of poverty, you're out of poverty. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. That's one of the things, you know, we, we, if we see the Christmas cards where the, where the king, you know, three wise men came to Jesus and when he was born, that sort of thing, and they brought gifts of frankincense and gold and myrrh. And uh, what, what you don't just automatically read in the text is do a little history on you and find out something. These were not just three wise men from the east. They were king makers. The Magi. They were king makers. If they come to your house and when you when they left, you were on the financial level of a king. Amen. That's right. Mm -hmm. By the way. All right. Verse 7 of, of 2 Samuel chapter 9. It says, And David said unto Mephibosheth, said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And I'll restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. Look at it in your Bible. I've got a dunder line in my Bible. Thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Bless God. Here's a king telling a lame legged, dirty, <laughs> poverty ridden I, uh, just person. You're going to eat forever at my table. Glory to God. That's a perfect picture of you and I when we come to, when we come to the Lord. Here's, here's the king. Everybody know Jesus is the king, all right? Amen. We're this messed up <coughs> mess out here in the Molly Grubs, and the, the Holy Ghost come and got us. Glory to God. And if you'll listen, you'll hear, you'll hear the Lord say, you can eat at my table continually if you want to. Amen. Mephibosheth had the right to refuse that. I ain't eating your table. You don't like me. I don't like you. I've heard all these rumors about you. David, I'm out of here. He could have done that. But he didn't. Glory to God. Even though he was lame in his walk and had an imperfect walk before God, the king still extended to him the provision of his table. Here's the interesting thing about sitting at anybody's table. You cannot even have any legs. 
messed up legs or not. If you're sitting at the table, nobody can see them. Right, bless God. Your lameness is out of sight. Anybody here says me? Amen. Bless God. When Jesus invites you to his table, he's not looking at your messed up legs. What does that mean? He's not looking at your messed up walk in life. He's not looking at that. He's looking at this soul. He's looking at this heart that he loves so dearly enough to die for. Yes, bless God. And he did. Died for you. And here's, here's a statement he made. If you'll just keep bringing your lame feet to my table, we'll get the lame feet fixed. Yes, bless God. Just keep coming to the table. Don't let the guilt, don't let the condemnation, don't let the fear, don't let the religious yuck out there in the world rob you of coming to my table. You may not just automatically, folks, I'm fixing to preach and I'm not a preacher. Obey the Lord. I'm a teacher. <laughs> I feel it coming on. You just keep bringing your lame self to the king's table. You're sitting at the king's table right now. Amen. Feeding on the word of God. And that's what this is speaking of. It's a natural table there with natural food. The Bible says in Psalm 23, I'm sure you all read it one time enough. He said, the Lord has prepared a, a table before my enemies. And what's on that table? Well, there's, there's emotional stability. There's strength in body. There's financial prosperity. There's emotional prosperity. There's social prosperity. There's health of every kind, glory to God. There's the fruits of the big bowl of the fruit of the Spirit sitting out there. Love, joy, peace, meekness, temperance, love, I don't know, peace. Whole bunch of, and then there's that new wine sitting out there. Amen. Whole bunch of good stuff on the king's table. But if you don't come to that table, it's just wasted. It ain't going to go to waste. Mm -hmm. If you don't want your part, I'll take it. Lord, Come on, guys. You don't have to give an offering this morning if you don't want to. Obey the Lord. <laughs> he said, he, look at verse, verse 7. He shall eat bread at my table continually. And if that wasn't bodacious, well, let me just turn over here one page. Uh, 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 here, here was Mephibosheth's response to that. See, he's, he's, all he's aware of is his lame feet messed up self. That's all he's aware of. And he said, ver, 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 verse, verse 8, what is thy servant that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I? That's the definition of lame feet. Well, I'm just a sorry, no good for nothing, yada, 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 yada. But if we ever learn how to walk right, you start saying, I'm the righteousness of God. Amen. I've been made to be accepted in the Lord. I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In him I live and move and have my being. Yes, amen. And it just goes on and on and on for another 130 some odd verses of who I am. My feet was lame, but they ain't lame anymore. Amen. As long as I'll keep feeding at the king's table. Now listen, you can't go over to watch his name's table and eat on that stuff where it tells you what a dirty rat you are. Tells you what a sorry, no good for nothing you are. And then he'll nail you with a feeling. Yeah, you just feel like you're no good. And then people down at that church, they don't like me. I mean, I'm just plain old men. And after all, that preacher wears a tie. I don't even fit in down there. <laughs> and the only reason you think like that is because your feet's messed up. <laughs> but if you keep coming to the king's table and your feet gets fixed. Amen. And your walk of life changes. Until after a while you start seeing yourself like Jesus sees you. The Greek definition for the word love in the New Testament is agape. I don't know if you've ever heard that word or not, but it's agape. You know what the word agape means? It means it sees everybody valuable and precious. Amen. Do you know you're part of everybody? Amen. God sees you valuable and precious. Thank you, Jesus. Any brother and sister worth his salt in the Lord ought to be, that's where they're supposed to see one another as valuable and precious. All you got to do is insult one out there and they get mad and throw something at you because their feet's all messed up. Am I here by myself this morning? I'll take it up too often just to get even with you. No, I ain't going to do that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at it. Look at it. Verse, uh, what about it? Verse 10. Let's jump down to verse 10. And, there, and therefore, uh, and thou therefore, and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for, for Mephibosheth, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that my master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Twice he said that. Eat bread. The king said that to the old dirty dog thing he found down in Lodabar. 
He should eat at my table continually. Okay? Verse 11. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that the Lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. That's three times. Drop down there, verse 13. And so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table. Four times in one chapter, the king said, this repentant-minded, messed-up dude, <laughs> this tattered rags and his brain and his mind and his emotions looks just like his clothes, has a right to come and sit at my table continually. You've got to know, I mean just by association, you've got to know that the more he sat at David's table and the more he listened to King David and the more he looked at King David, the more like King David he became. We sung a song in ancient words a while ago, Changing Me and Changing You. The Bible tells you in 2 Corinthians, I think that we can find it. But we are changed from glory to what? We're changed into his image by the word. That's right, Amen. But you only get that word. I'm sorry, but that's Christian shit. I mean, I got, I got the microphone. Glory <laughs> <laughs> Probably get the word in other places too, but not like here. <laughs> Hallelujah. The more you listen to the word of God, the more like God you become. Amen. How many problems does God have? Amen. He overcomes them all. I mean, Jesus was so bodacious to make this statement. He said, "What did you convince me of sin?" I could point out about 9,900 people could convince me <laughs> of sin. I'm whittling that down. Ain't as many as it used to be. Getting a little better. Thank you, Jesus. But you have to make a decision to come to the table. Anybody here beside me? Amen. Somebody somewhere made the statement, you are what you eat. And that is so true. All you got to do is just get you a, you know, big bottle of Pepsi and a big box of donuts and just see what happens. I mean, you're going to be this year's Goodyear blimp in just a little while. you become a big donut. But the more you consume this information, and I mean, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The more you consume this knowledge, this knowledge is the written, is Jesus in written form. And the more you consume this knowledge, the more like Jesus you become. That's right. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Until after a while, you lose this dead dog mentality. That's what he come to the table with. He said, ooh, wow. I mean, why are you looking at such a dead dog like me? Well, that's, that's the definition of lame feet. It's in a natural context when you find it. But the spiritual connotation is... His walk and, 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 and his, his messed up self had created a mind, mindset, I'm just trash. Just bleh. Yeah. When I was on a drove trucking years ago, everybody had their secret CB code name. Mine was Abraham, man. I thought, I'm just going to bless the world. Mine was Abraham. They said, oh, the, the first president or something like that. They didn't even know who the first president was. But they thought talking about Abraham Lincoln. I said, no, follow the faithful. Well, that's when they, wanted, they quit talking to me then. But there's, a, there's one of them guys out there. Everybody had crazy CB name, but one of them was just plain old trash. And that's what everybody called him. That's how he saw himself. Just trash. You know what it took to redeem you to God? We've not been redeemed by corrupt things like silver and gold. That's sort of thing. A lot of it's valuable in our mind, but it took something really, really precious to redeem you to God. And the Bible calls it the precious blood of Jesus. Yes. And the reason it took something precious to redeem you to God is because that's your value. Yes. Yes. You're precious. Yes. Bless God. Amen. I don't feel precious. And half the church and all my relatives told me I wasn't precious. <laughs> so I must not be precious. Why won't we ask God what he thinks about us? Amen. You know, I have to believe anybody can create the universe. <laughs> Man, just get your telescope and check that out. Anybody that can create that and then get your microscope and check out the micro, you know, the micro world, 
Somebody created that. The same guy did both of them was God. Amen. Anybody with the ability to do that, if he's got anything else to say, he probably knows what he's talking about. Amen. Isn't that right? Amen. And he said, you're what? You're precious. precious. Amen. I don't feel precious. He said, well, we're not going to feelings. No, we want the faith, not the sight. Amen. We want the faith, not the feelings. Amen. If I went the feelings, I'd have been out here a long time ago. Amen. Man, I'd be sending you a postcard from Tahiti, sipping on whatever they got down there and say, having fun, wish you were here. If I went the feelings. <laughs> it's not every devil in the world that's happy about the word of God being in Mount Judy, Arkansas. That's right. Help us, Lord. I don't know, we've had our brains beat out. I'll tell you if we can just say it in those terms. I mean, everything in the world has got us. And we just look it right back in the face and bless God, we win. Amen. We win. Amen. Glory to God. We've got to feed him. The Bible says, having done all, stand. Well, if your feet's all messed up, you can't stand. Isn't that right? You can read that in Ephesians chapter 6. Right. Having done all, stand. Well, there's no stuff about spiritual matters and battles we fight and that sort of thing. But the, but the physical implication is there. Y'all get anything out of this today? Yes, amen. amen. Four times in one chapter, the king told an old, dirty, dog-minded dude, <laughs> come to my house, eat at my table, continue. The implication is, and the picture is, that Christ the Lord, Amen. And all his great splendor and glory has invited you to feed continually at his table. You have to make the decision to come. Amen. That's right. Free will. He didn't make the Fibosheth come. He just invited him. Amen. Didn't make it. The Fibosheth says, nah, man, I like it during a motor bar. Man, I'm just one of them old, sorry, no good bunch that live down there, and I'm just like them, and I just I just feel comfortable around them. I don't like I don't like that king atmosphere. I'm not a king person. He could have thought like that. And died in Lodabar. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Mephibosheth fell when he was just a young man. I got it in my little, my little paragraph thought here. Children learn. Children learn. Fear, failure, unbelief, emotional instability, warped personalities, hatred, confusion. They learn, and many other things, but they learn that. I learned that. We all learn that. In the home, the school, or the church, or from any other authoritative figure. Because all they got is somebody's an authority. Tell you, let me tell you a story. This young man, when he was, I don't know, second, second grade or so, it was quite some time ago, uh, uh, the, the school teacher, he's, he's like in second grade, but the school teacher, well, how old are you if you're, if you're in second grade? What would that be? Eight or nine years. So really impressionable. The school teacher, was, she already took out behind the church, the schoolhouse, tied to a tree, and 12 grown men prayed for her all night. <laughs> but the school teacher got this young man, this young kid, 10 year old so, and, and at that time, <coughs> There's a classroom here and a classroom here and a door between them. She went over there and opened this door and got right into the, in the, in the door with this young man and got the attention of both classrooms and said, hey, listen, he said, y'all see this fellow right here? He's stupid. He is, she just called him just an awful bunch. Well, he just believed it. <coughs> she's an authority. She must know what she's talking about. I must be stupid. And he went the next several years in and out of reform school and penitentiaries and every kind of crazy stuff that you can imagine, all because of that one statement that that woman made over him. I was on the school board here at Mount Judy for a little while, and I said, listen, his teachers won't be hired for a job. I said, I'm sure your qualifications is good. But I said, you be careful what you tell them kids, because they'll believe every word you say. Amen. I said, you tell them they're worthless, they'll believe that, and they'll grow up with that mindset. They didn't like my gospel brought to the table, but I did it anyway. And son, like 19 years later, God got a hold of that young man in a prison cell. By the way, his dad built the prison, and now he's in the prison that his dad built. God got a hold of him. Somehow the Lord, the Holy Ghost went in that prison, got a hold of him, and made a new man out of him. 
And today he has a mega church in South Chicago. Rob Thompson, you go hunt him up. He's known around the world. Yeah. Around the world. Amen. Nationally, uh, for sure. But he's known around the world for his faith message and for this relationship that he's got with God. Totally changed his life. Amen. Nothing religious about the man. Religion, well, Jesus don't like religion. <laughs> he likes relationship. Amen. But all these negatives are learned in the home. And so here's the picture of it. It's in Mephibosheth here where this caretaker, guardian, overseer, made this fear-based decision. We've got to get out of Dodge because David's come to kill us all. And the whole process, he falls. Now he's lame his feet. He's all messed up. And since something don't change, he's going to grow up with lame feet and just duplicating, killing and stealing and destroying everywhere he goes because he's in poverty and all messed up. And uh, he's just going to duplicate that everywhere he goes. Don't get anything out of that. Y'all seen the picture in this? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Faithfulness to be at the king's table will heal the lameness in your walk. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, socially, and your old dead dog attitude will leave. How many of you have ever felt like you're just worthless? Mm -hmm. Show your hands. Mm -hmm. Been there. <laughs> Ron said, I got them both. <laughs> You're a good company, dear. I think every one of us has had those emotional feet. All of us have. But if we'll ever learn to believe what Jesus said about us, yes. I am precious to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, any thought I come up with, it's just the way he sees us. I mean, you check out creation in the first two chapters of Genesis. I mean, he said he built, he made, created this, said that's good, and he built that, and said this is good, and he made that, and boy, boy, that's good. And he kept making things, and he came in, he made a man. He said, whoa, man, that's very good. Amen. We're descendants of that. It's just the devil wrecked it. He kind of just messed it all up. Put lameness in everybody's feet. We inherited from our parents. Or some other authoritative, you know, the, the orphanage or wherever it is, I mean, whoever's taking care of us. There's some place where there's nobody taking care of us. And we get to think, well, man, I am dirt. I'm worse than dirt. Ain't nobody like me. You know, I ain't, ain't nobody care. And then that just burns your thinking completely. But you're an awesome individual. Awesome. And it took the stretched out, bleeding body of the Lord Jesus Christ to prove that. Amen. There's a man one time, he's my boss. He's my, he's my boss. He had a name, I don't even tell you what his name is, but his name alone make him mad. Is your name? Anybody call that one? What's your problem? But he had an attitude. And you talk about lame feet. He had an attitude that all messed up. And he didn't care a bit in the world to share that with whoever. And I come into work one day after an Oklahoma lived out there, and I come clocked in, you know, had that clock we'd work with. And I turned around there, he's standing right in front of me, and he called me everything in the world. I thought, man, what did I do? Now, what's your problem? I didn't say a word. But he just flat out unloaded on me. And that ain't smart to do that to my boys in Newton County, Arkansas, but he didn't know it. And so I had these urges to correct his thinking. But I'm in Bible school, and they knew I was in Bible school, and I thought, this ain't going to work. <laughs> so I just kind of looked at him and walked around him and went down the hallway going to where I was, my, my, my workstation. And on my walk down that hallway going to where I, my work, where I work at, I, thought his, his, I mean, I'm saying it out loud. I mean, he's coming up out of me. And I, said, I said, God... I said, if you'll just give me an opportunity, I'll apologize to that man. Because of what I was thinking five minutes earlier, two minutes earlier, it wasn't pretty. He was a whole lot less than Christian. I said, Lord, forgive me. I said, I don't walk by faith. I don't walk beside, I walk by faith. I don't walk beside, I walk in love. I, I, I walk in love. I'm a born again child of God. I walk in love. I don't walk beside, I walk in love. I'm saying this out loud, going in this hallway. Mm -hmm. I said, Lord, if you give me an opportunity. I'll apologize to him, but he don't know what he, I didn't say a word. But he didn't I mean he didn't know what I was thinking. I was thinking bloody thoughts. <laughs> well it wasn't, I don't know, three or four minutes 
this man walked into that room where I'm working in, in that hospital out there in Oklahoma. And I said, Mr. and I called his name. I said, I got something I want to say to you. Just like that. The boy's like a magnet. He's right here. Right in my face. He said, what is it? I said, God Almighty loves you. And he gave the life of his son, Jesus Christ, to prove that love. And I said, if he can love you, I can too. You should have seen it. You couldn't have hit him up beside the head and knocked him any farther across that room. He went back. He was, trying, he was on his heels trying to get his balance. He went plumb the other side of that room. And when he got his balance, he came right back up here and he said, he started stuttering. He said, well, I, 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 uh, 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 well I'm, I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I thought, sure you are. <laughs> that man turned out to be the best friend I had in the hospital. I mean, I don't know how, how the Lord got that done, but when I... When I quit, when I and I left, we were both working at the hospital. When I left, they had they threw a party. There were streamers hanging from the ceiling. There was cake. There was ice cream. They were whoop and plume and whistled. You know, they threw a party. I don't know if it's because he's glad to see me leave. Maybe that's what it was. I don't know. But they had a party. And the same guy that was trying to draw blood out of me, he, he presents me with a gift and I opened it up and it was a, I still have the thing. It's a golden, it's a gold colored 12 inch ruler. And then caption wrote on it says there's no reason for it. It's just our policy whatever you want to apply that to. But he handed me that gift and was shaking my hand. And he said, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. And I thought he was going to never hush. It went on and on and on. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. I guess he's wanting me to bless him. I don't know. But that one statement forever wrecked that man's world. We think we're the sorriest thing on two feet. But God loves you. And he gave them blood of Jesus, his son, to prove that love. What's that worth to you? What's that mean to you? What's that saying to you? Do you know the Bible? Let me tell you, let me run this back. The Bible actually says every sin in your entire life that you've ever committed is already forgiven. Except one. There's one outstanding sin that is not under the blood. And that's your rejection of Christ. Your rejection of him. That's the one you have to present to him and say, Father, forgive me. I just, forgive me for rejecting you, for refusing Christ. See, Mephibosheth could have refused the king. Everything that was wrong in Mephibosheth's lame feet was already in David's mind. Forget it. That's cut. Park around the table. We're not even going to see your feet. But there was this one outstanding thought that only Mephibosheth could get fixed. And that was bringing himself to the table faithfully. Accepting the king's offer. Y'all get anything out of that? Yeah, sure. It's that one moment that you and I have to deal with. Lord, forgive me for, for refusing. Let me just read it. Y'all read it with me. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 10. Somewhere in Romans. Those of you who are real spiritual, you know where I'm going. Romans chapter 10. <laughs> Read your Bible with me. <coughs> Romans chapter 10. You found it, say amen. 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 Verse 6 in Romans chapter 10 says, The righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Now, whatever else it says righteousness does or does not say, it says it speaks. How many want to be righteous? How many want to be right with God? There's something you have to say to get that done. Then it goes and tells you what not to say. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven that is bring Christ down? Or say not in your heart, who shall descend into the deep that is to bring Christ up again from the dead? Don't say those things. Verse 8. But what does it say? What does the righteousness which is by faith say? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. And that's what this church is, is the word of faith. Church, okay? Which we preach. Verse 9. Look at verse 9. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
God will think about it for about 400 million years with the Savior or not. He might do it. You know, if he's just having a good day, it ain't all. <laughs> Thou shalt be saved. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That's the one thing you've got to deal with is your relationship with Jesus. All the other stupid stuff you and I have done is already covered by the blood. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you'll confess with your mouth, let's see, well, verse 9, uh, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, God who cannot lie, said you shall be saved, verse 10, for with the heart, not the blood, but we're not talking about the blood, we're talking about the very core, your inner, your spirit man. If, if with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Thank you, Jesus. I want to see a show of hands. How many want to be saved? Amen. We are saved. Bless God. Okay, you got nine. You want to be saved? Yeah, sure. Bless the Lord. Amen. You, you want to be saved? I want to see a show of hands. Who wants to be saved? We are saved. Okay. Bless God. Bless God. Amen. We're going to get that done right now. Okay. And those of you that are already saved, Paul said, we're, until Barnabas, he said, let's go back to the churches where we preach and let's just confirm the souls where we preach. So you're going to get reconfirmed. Bless the Lord. You're going to get confirmed. Amen. Bless God. Have you ever been confirmed before? <laughs> you ever had a preacher to confirm me? Well, I'm not sure what that is. But those of you who are not saved, you're fixed to get a new life. Amen. Bless the Lord. All right. Let me read it again. Look at it in your Bible. <clears throat> If you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. And it's impossible for God to lie. Yes, bless God. The Bible says so. Mm -hmm. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All right, everybody, bow your head and say these words after me, okay? Everybody. Yeah. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I believe. I believe. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was, crucified was crucified on a cross. On a cross. He, died. he died. I believe he died, I believe he died. and was buried. I believe, I believe you raised him from the dead. From the dead. Heavenly, Father, Heavenly Father, I claim, I claim Jesus, Christ Jesus Christ as my Lord, as my Lord and my Savior. And my Savior. I, believe I believe he was made to be Made to be a sacrifice, a sacrifice for, me. for me. I claim that sacrifice. I, claim that. <coughs> I confess with my mouth, I with my mouth. And, I believe in my heart and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died, for me died for me and rose from the dead, from, the dead. From, my justification. from my justification. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father. Father, I am your child. Father, I am your child. You're my God. You are my God. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. I look to you, I look to, you. to guide me, to guide me. All, the all the days of my life. With your help, with your help, I'll serve you. I'll serve you for the rest of my days. For the rest of my days. So be it. Bless God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let me have you some fun. Bless the Lord. If, if you did, if you quoted that after me. Child of God. Amen. But listen, I was born in a hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. I am now a child of Raymond and Irene Johnson. I have legal standing in that household. But at some point, I could have made a decision. I don't undo that household. And died in the gutters and the streets of Kansas City. Although I had every right and privilege of that household. There's a refrigerator in that house, and there's anything in it I have legal right to. You know what that means? I mean, I got access and right to everything Daddy's got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I had to make a decision to stay in Father's house. That's right. Amen. You just entered the realm of the spirit world through Jesus Christ. If you, Amen. If you, if you, if you repeated what I just said. Okay. Amen. Bless the Lord. But like Mephibosheth, you know, he was invited. He took the king upon the offer. You're invited. To be right here, continually at the king's table. Amen. And if you don't sit at the king's table somewhere, I promise you, your lame feet will rule. I promise you, the dead dog mentality will govern your days. Amen. Maybe you like this old dead dog. I was in church in St. Louis. 
This lady comes to me and she said, why don't you come out there in the parking lot and pray for my dog? I said, okay. I thought, where's the pastor at? Why don't he pray for the dog? I'm just visiting. I mean, I'm saying, look, I'm just visiting. And so I got in the parking lot, she raised the trunk up. I thought, the dog's in the trunk, huh? And she pulls out a five-gallon bucket and takes a lid off of it. And she said, that's my dog. He's been, he been dead for a week. I've been hauling. It took me a week to get here. The dog's dead in the bottom of a five-gallon bucket. What do you do with a dead dog in the bottom of a five-gallon bucket? I thought, well, I can be rude. I can be... I'll just be courteous and pray. I got through praying, she put the lid back in the bucket and went back to Kansas where she's from. I don't know if the dog ever came out of the bucket or not. <laughs> I thought, man, where's the pastor? What? I mean, they don't even know me at this church. How, what am I doing out here in the parking lot? <laughs> That's where you should come out. <laughs> you can fix that dead stuff. Like, I don't know, where's Rhonda when you need her? I don't know, after a week. It's kind of a while. Amen. But go ahead, you can, you can entertain a dead dog mentality if you like. God called you precious. The Lord touched her heart. Amen. She had faith in you. Apparently so. Mm -hmm. The Lord told her. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> you got to come to the table, guys. Amen. We just believe this is the best table in town, but that's just us. You got to come to the table somewhere. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Those of you viewing by the internet or the DVD, I just want you to know, if you heard anything on this message at all, God loves you, gave the life of His Son Jesus to <laughs> provide you the life of, of, of this eternal life that He's offering. Heaven is real, but so is hell. God's not sending anybody to hell, but He'll give you what you want. He'll see to it that you get what you want. If you go to hell, it's a decision you make. But on the other hand, you make a decision for Jesus just as easy. Claim him as your Lord. That's a simple prayer we just prayed a while ago. Make it your own. Mm -hmm. Receive him as your Lord and your Savior. And regardless of what we think about it, the Lord's coming. Jesus is coming back. And there's a, whew, man, there's a judgment moment coming. I like to be on the good side of God when that happens, don't you? Amen. All you got to do is just believe in your heart, confess your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord, repent of living your life for yourself. I mean, you see what a mess you made out of that already. If you could have made things better, you'd have done that yesterday. Let Jesus into your life. Let him help you with your life. And your future will be a lot different. Amen. Things will get a lot better. Amen. Praise God. Until next time, God bless. Amen. Hallelujah.